Coming up next, we have Animoca Brands, uh, a glimpse into the future of entertainment through gamification and NFTs with Yatsu from Animoca Brands and Kaya Mai Stewart from Bitscore. So I'll just hand over to both of you if you could pop your cameras on and your microphones on and we can get going. Hi, Rachel, thank you. Yatsu, are you here? I am here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. It's a great privilege to have you here. And I want to jump in because we only have 25 minutes to get into the future of, um, you know, or the glimpse of the future anyway, of, of what's next. Sure. We've been talking yeah. about a lot of the integral parts of um, sort of where NFTs are headed. Um, you started at Atari in the 80s. You've been through multiple paradigms as a, as a pioneer. Oh. In I, I didn't start Atari. I worked at Atari, just to be clear. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in the 80s, you were at Atari. And um, in my mind, uh, that's like sort of the gamification um, beginning of, of a narrative and a, and a shift through all these different paradigms as, as we get to Crypto Kitties, where briefly at the beginning of the, well, not even briefly, I think it's it went into Top Shot. Everything's great. You'll talk about it. But we've moved from um, thinking about mobile gaming, thinking about uh, desktop gaming, and now considering uh, scarcity and digital value um, in the ecosystem of today. And you're going to take us through sort of the history of where you've been and what got you thinking about NFTs and gamification and more. And then we're going to ask you questions about it. So people, throw your questions into the chat. Um, I'm Kai Meyer Stewart, I'm in, inconsequential to this conversation in the sense that I'm here to learn. I work for a cybersecurity company trying to build um, essentially data sovereignty and other aspects of um, cryptographic security into everyday software as a service. Um, that's why I'm here, is to learn more about how NFTs can, can play into that. So Yatsu, please take us through uh, the history and we will... Right. Keep an eye on the chat for questions. Yes, thank you. So I, I did prepare just a small number of slides that I've been go through, but yeah, just just briefly. I mean, I think the history of video games is interesting because really it's trained a whole generation of people about sort of an element of virtual assets and virtual value, you know, over over like three or four decades really. And now we are at this place where you know, you know, NFTs and digital ownership is actually something you know of relevance. So. Uh, if you can see this presentation, I'm not going to spend too much time about our history, but you know we are an Australian corporation, uh, you know, and we have a history in Australia as a, as a company originally in video games, and really got into NFTs four years ago through CryptoKitties, and had the good fortune to also become ultimately their publishers in the region as well as investors in Dapper Labs, um, amongst many other things that we've done. And many people think of us as a video game company because we started with video games because of that same sort of paradigm around ownership of virtual assets is probably better understood with gamers, at least that's what we think. Um, but actually, ultimately, this is about uh, property rights for everyone, which I'll quickly go and, and how I'd, I'd like to sort of describe how we think of NFTs and why we think it's important. This is very briefly only in terms of our history. At this point, you know, we've done well over 80 investments in the space as well as building our own, like the sandbox and so on. Uh, so, you know, chances are if you're involved in NFTs, you will have touched you know, either one of our products or one of our portfolios, whether it's OpenSea for the marketplace or, or maybe Wax or Bitski, or whether it's Axie Infinity because you're playing the games or you know, um, sort of, or maybe even F1 Delta Time or with Rev or with Sandbox. You know, these are all sort of companies within the family of Animoca brands. And we think of ourselves almost as an eco ecosystem in the open metaverse. And these are sort of, you know, the sort of metaverses that we're building ourselves you know, whether it's the Sandbox, uh, F1 Delta Time, or most recently Phantom Galaxies, uh, and a bunch of others. So you can learn more about us on our website. Let's get into the meat of things as to what we think is so important and why we're so excited about this space and have been building in the last four years, including a number of sacrifices we had to make to get to this point. Um, what are non-fungible tokens to us? And I think we all know what NFTs are technically, so I won't spend time on this, but I want to spend a little bit of time on you know, the world's most valuable resource which is in fact data, right? The world has moved and shifted away from this idea that you know, what we dig from the ground, whether this be oil or what we grow is actually a scarce resource because in the future or even in the present, it is not. Actually, the data is valuable. And the interesting thing about this particular resource is that it actually comes from us as humans, as people. We're the ones who are creating this, which is actually the paradigm where we can actually start creating a form of our own digital equity and this data is actually a derivative of our time. And this time that we spend 
is actually what we think is truly scarce. When people talk about NFTs, they talk about the scarcity. Yes, it is scarce, but what is we don't think of it in terms of the manufacturer scarcity only in terms of here's a piece of art or photo that's only made five or 10 pieces. We think of the scarcity of the production of it as a matter of time, because each and every one of us has a limited time on this planet. Ultimately, we will die, which means that the way we spend our time is the ultimate scarcity. Right? Do we spend a time with family? Do we actually sort of you know, work for a company and make some money? Do we build a business? Do we make art? Right? That is the actual parallel, and that is how we think of it in terms of you know, data and the equivalent of that with non-fungible tokens in that sort of digital aspect. But there is one problem. This most valuable of resources, which is your time, is actually not owned by you. You're generating all this value in the platforms today. You're spending time, right? We're connecting. And this data is pieces of information. Just like we're having this conversation right now, we're gaining some information out of this exchange and we may walk away with different types of knowledge, but we walk out with something. Except the platform has refined this in a process where they can actually generate billions of data points, actually trillions out of a billion users every second, which basically means that they have the deepest knowledge about us. And the most absurd thing is that we give them that data for free, which means we actually have no data rights over the data we have. And the knowledge that is generated is sold back to us in the form of pay us for advertising, or you know, here's a service you need. And in fact, we are manipulated by this, which is the birth of fake news, information manipulation, and all these problems that we have today. But what it ultimately means is that we're living in a kind of age of digital colonialism, where actually we don't own any of our data where we were being exploited by that real resource. And where effectively those platforms are continuously harvesting network effect of this data that we willingly give up because we don't consider data as a kind of human right. We think of data just as information that we generate, but we haven't yet made the bridge over from the physical to the virtual, except that the virtual world is in fact perhaps even more important to many of us, not just because we're in NFTs, but because if we are deplatformed from the online world, Actually, do we have the same abilities? Can we make friends the same way? Can we conduct business the same way? Chances are we actually have lesser rights and lesser abilities as human beings in the physical world. Actually, this becomes really critical. And the world we live in today is basically this, which is basically sort of a set where essentially the whole world is controlled in these walled gardens, in these digital kingdoms, in which we basically exist in at their mercy and at their pleasure, at their terms of service. And we all know sort of the consequences of what that looks like. Enter basically this space here, which is, you know, virtual goods, you know, which is all rental today, which already generates $100 billion in these games that are kingdoms of their own. You know, one of the exciting things about this is actually what happens to these environments when actually you take those gaming assets and actually you turn them into real assets, right? One that actually is, you know, through non-fungible tokens and tokens and sort of blockchain actually has real provenance, real value, and is composable, you know, we think this will turn this rental economy into one of ownership, which is basically why we're seeing this value explosion. And the way we think of NFTs is that they're essentially openly composable assets. We think NFTs are open assets and are going to do to digital assets what open source did to closed source. Basically the weight and the gravity of NFTs is gonna attract other institutions, companies, groups, and games to build layers on top of these experiences. In other words, the center of that experience ends up being the asset and not actually sort of the game itself or the ink system. Digital assets essentially is our property. And the other thing that's really important is that we think that owning and understanding these digital property rights is what will create a truly democratic framework for the internet, as it were, because we now have something to protect. In the same way that if you own something physically as real estate or something like that, you now have something to protect. How do you protect it? You care about governance. You compare about a democratic institution to ensure that the judiciary or the laws in place protect your property rights. That is what's missing in the digital world and NFTs will deliver that. So the high level view of this one is that this is much more than just here's an NFT and it's a wonderful JPEG. Yes, that's part of the joke and the reality, but actually what really matters is that people can then start building on top of these and add sort of uh, new, new layers new layers of experiences around it. And what it means that the center of that experience becomes the NFT itself. And the other thing about that center of experiences is that we think of NFTs as these stores of culture. We also think NFTs are going to completely onboard you know, the masses because actually we engage with culture much more than we engage with money. Of course, value is important and the sense of value 
has has is, is gives it a sort of validation. But you know, when we buy a collectible in the physical world, or we want an autograph from BTS, we don't do it because we want to flip it right away, right? Just like when we buy a car, we don't want to buy a car because we can sell it tomorrow. We have a utility, we use it for culture, we, de we, we, we desire the fashion, the look or whichever. And the other thing is it's also entirely creative. This is the other thing about sometimes I think is interesting about NFTs is that actually, you know, just like in the physical world, you know, when you buy an Hermes bag, actually, what are you buying? You're not buying sort of the fabric is made of, you're buying 99.9% .9 a virtual creation, an idea, and actually a form of data, except it's creative data. And we're just translating that effectively from the physical world into the virtual world. And maybe the understanding isn't quite there, but it's actually in some part very similar. And so now you have things like virtual real estate, you know, like Snoop Dogg just recently launched something with our sandbox, you know, where they basically, he, he's, he's launching a virtual party. But what's interesting in this one is that, you know, outside of the value of the virtual real estate in sandbox around sort of, you know, where, where Snoop Dogg's going to build his concert is the fact that now he has a way in which he can interact with his fans directly and at scale, as opposed to having a concert. He can now actually have thousands of people he could interact with, you know, almost simultaneously, as opposed to a concert, which is another way to interact, but really is more one dimensional in nature. And that's actually going to happen with every aspect of culture that we see today and expect everything to be touching NFTs, you know, um, and, you know, in, in with, with not just with celebrities, but with like everyone. The other thing which I think will be covered later, but is worth to note is now that you have ownership of these assets, you have paradigms of value, right? So play to earn is one of those things because now you can combine, you know, basically the, the capital class of people who own assets and who can rent them out to players who can basically play them. So with our sort of, you know, F1 Delta time and, and we're racing, you know, we have some people, and this is an Australian example, someone in Australia who ended up making, you know, basically close to $4,000 a week racing in this game and basically putting enough money down to, to buy a house in Queensland, for example. But of course, you know, we all know about the stories about sort of what's happening in the Philippines, right, with Axie Infinity, which is also one of our earliest portfolios, you know, where they basically ended up, you know, literally lifting people out of poverty, especially during COVID, where they didn't have a chance to work, and where basically people who own the Axies through the scholarship program were able to rent out the assets to players, um, you know, in places like the Philippines to generate yield. And so just like, you know, sort of, I guess, drivers and cars and medallions, you basically have the same parallel in the metaverse. And actually the metaverse worker isn't one that's only playing one metaverse game. He's doing many of them at the same time. And so I wanna, I wanna quickly close with this one and then we can go to Q&A and any conversations you have on this, which is basically about sort of where's the metaverse going? You know, when I talk about openly composable assets, we need the metaverse to be open and which is the reason why we as a company don't just build our own metaverses, we invest in many of them and continue to invest in it. Because basically the network effect is such that if every, you know, if the, if the open metaverse grows, just like open source, then essentially the entire network grows and we all benefit. It's kind of the end of the classic zero sum thinking of, let me build a monopoly and sort of exclude. It's rather much more inclusive as an approach. Think of it slightly differently. What would have happened if open source code actually had the ability to have a token infrastructure and actually had a way in which its value was fairly distributed amongst the contributors of that open source. The actual engineer would actually receive a small, small, tiny proportion of the benefits of having created Huawei or Lenovo or Google or pretty much every tech company in the world. And instead of working for that tech company for the derivative of a reasonably good salary, he actually may be contributing much more openly into open source and giving back to it because he gets a benefit back to it because that's his job to contribute to open source or contribute to his code base and everyone else benefits from that network effect. Right? That's basically what the open metaverse is about. When Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg start talking about they're the next metaverse, it scares me because actually I think that is the biggest threat that we face because of the whole sort of convenience. When we got involved, you know, I started one of the first ISPs in Hong Kong in 93 and, you know, it was un inconceivable that, you know, web one or web two would become a closed ecosystem. Yet here we are, right? And so I guess the big thing for us is as our approach outside of building and being open in our own infrastructure, we want to invest and grow as a company, uh, basically in all the other platforms as we can to help promote essentially a more inclusive open metaverse as a whole. Yeah, thank you. 
Wow, thank you so much for that. That was an amazing 15 minutes. I think everyone in the chat is sort of aligned. And um, this reminds me that this is an ideology and a philosophy and a community movement, as much, much like the open source movement, as much as it's about you know technology and the cool collectibles. And it's great to zoom out to that philosophical thinking because we also are on the verge of an amazing opportunity to, uh, in this new paradigm, do things in a, a maybe a bit better of a way than we've done in the past, give equity um, back to, well, equity is about fair distribution, right? And I love you how you talked about playing multiple roles and the value of time. And I think my first question was going to be why all the great um, investment in so many partnerships and projects? And I think you've answered that question. You want to bring everybody further and we'll go for it together with like a more diverse ecosystem. Um, is that part and parcel of that as well? Just bringing everyone on to something that they can recognize um, and use and um, compose whatever their level of uh, technical. So I think one of the big things about open source was it created incredible wealth for people who knew how to use open source, which basically meant the people who knew how to code. And so inadvertently, we actually created a small new elite class of engineers, right? Which you go to Silicon Valley, right? And all those people who are the very successful, you know, because they knew how to code, they knew that language. But the problem is most of us still don't know this language and actually it's difficult to do so. But when you think about something like sort of digital assets, you know, artists, creators, musicians, like everything actually can start following this paradigm and you can now openly compose even if you don't know how to code. That's an incredible revolution. And in the past, you know, we had platforms like YouTube that were created sort of, you know, with UGC and you make content, but you still existed on the terms of service of these platforms. And if YouTube said, I don't like you, which happens ever so often, then you lose everything, right? Which is basically why the blockchain matters in this particular case. The other thing I wanted to sort of point out about this is, you know, as data is sort of this valuable resource that comes from us, we think of this as a form of universal basic equity. You know, people talk about the future when, you know, machines are going to basically be running everything, right? In terms of the natural resources, right? You know, my parents' generation maybe even had to worry about food on the table. We don't have to worry about that anymore, right? So what do we, what do we need to worry about? And in this particular case, you know, it's about this inequity that we see. Inequity isn't just being fair. Inequity is the fact that we don't even have access to this type of stuff, right? You know, I can't buy my house because I can't afford it. I don't have a way to participate in this growth because I don't know financials. You know, one of the big injustices is the fact that, you know, we don't learn about finances actually at a young enough age. And by the time we go, there's a small elite that understands how to invest. And the capital that they've generated is the benefit that most of us have not been able to participate, except now this capital is ours. And universal basic income is sort of this hyper socialist view of, oh, we should give everyone a little bit of a stipend so they can survive and exist. To me, that's not very positive. But if it comes from universal basic equity, which comes from our data, then actually we are the generators of that equity. And even if it's not worth a, you know, more than the other person, it depends on what we put in. You know, it's like Facebook should be paying us for every minute that we're spending time on because we're making them valuable, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's kind of how we, how, how we think of that space. And therefore we can't construct, to your earlier point, we can't construct what that looks like exactly because it's the open metaverse. The imagination is rich for all of us to do. We, it's like saying, oh, you know what? Like human creativity should be in this bottle that we define. We don't think that's how it should work. Rather, we fund the smartest people in the space. We grow the space. We help the ecosystem. And because we're invested in all of them, we will also grow as a whole while our products have an incentive as well to stay open because we are participating in the open metaverse. Fantastic answer. And there are some great questions kind of that go off the back of that as well. And I'm just going to move right along because they're so great. Um, one of those questions is um, Megan Kel Keller is interested to hear your thoughts about the enclosure of digital terrains and how or if that's a response to data colonialism. Isn't that just the same thing as data colonialism? Well, so, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, data colonialism or sort of, you know, I guess feudalism, whichever you want to describe it, is essentially the reaction to attempt to sort of keep everything inside. And what's actually happened for those who might remember, actually the internet was a very open space pre-Facebook. And in fact, if you look at the Google business model, it originally was one which was dependent entirely on open internet, which is why it couldn't function so well in China when they sort of started to create restrictions. But when Facebook ended up sort of absorbing all that data and basically sort of controlling it, 
um, and not allowing others to index it and search it because you create a walled garden. It necessitated for survival reasons, other platforms, including Google, to create a walled garden as well, to say, actually, that's the data I have that you don't have. Therefore, I am able to sort of compete. And you ended up creating these type of data silos. But remember, how did Facebook become big in the first place? It didn't do it because it provided a closed platform. It did it because it was open. Everyone built and brought their users in. Remember Zynga and Farmville? Remember all these crazy apps that we're using? You know, those viral apps fed the data and brought the users to it. And after Facebook became fat and rich, it said, oh, thank you very much, and started closing the door. And that's the risk, right? If you become too centralized, then we end up falling into this trap regardless. But if you ensure that there's enough decentralization, like a healthy democracy that's essentially structured all over, then actually you create enough defense systems that this can't happen. You know, to a functioning democracy doesn't need 100% voting, right? If you get at least a third or 40% of the population to care, then you know, you're good, right? But the problem is in the digital space, we don't have ownership, so we don't think it matters. Why, why am I protecting something that's virtual when I don't own it? And that's why NFTs are powerful. If I own a virtual real estate on Sandbox that is worth $1,000, $10,000, or a million dollars, I want to make sure that value is there. I want to protect that. How do I protect that? To make sure that whoever governs that is actually the party that respects it. I need a voice. I need to be able to say something. That's where DAOs come in, where I can vote and own this. And more importantly, no government in the world can shut it down and no institution owns it. That's why blockchain is, you know, and Web3 is this incredibly powerful paradigm. And NFTs, because it brings culture into it, is the one that will bring us into that universe. But we have to move fast, right? If we, if we, if we try to make it ultra convenient, if we give in to, you know, oh, Facebook metaverse, that sounds like a great idea, we will end up losing all of us. Wow, uh, that's a lot to think about. And there's a fantastic question here from GT that sort of, again, plays into this question because ultimately um, we've defined ourselves as humans by the value that we, um, you know, value and scarcity that we put into things and becoming the, you know, centering the narrative around us being the generators of value is quite different. And the business models in the real world still aren't quite set up for that. So for example, um, as an investor in, you know, with a consummate amount of power in, in so many different projects, GT is asking, yeah, how do you separate or position yourself as a centralized company into a decentralized network? And I guess maybe the question of checks and balances kind of comes back into play. As long as we have 50% in the open metaverse of an investment, we ensure that the other half of our business doesn't get tempted towards control. And the other thing is that each one of our projects has already been established to move towards being a DAO. And so the way to think of this is, and, and I think this is how we ensure that even if I'm not around as an institution, as a structure, you know, and we are a public corporation, just to be clear, right? You know, we have shareholders and we have other people, but if we're set up in a certain way where it ensures that we sort of, you know, stay and build open, you know, because of that structure, then you know, future generations know that it's in the best interest to build in the open platform. And so when you think of Animoca brands in the future as a company, are we going to be running Sandbox you know, or running F1 Delta Time or Rev entirely? No, we want this to be a DAO. In fact, we are happy to have, you know, be like maybe a big landowner or be a big asset owner. You know, it's not too bad to own like a big chunk of real estate in Sydney, right? For instance, you know, that would be good. And then maybe we can own instead of having sort of, you know, sort of control only in one city, but we end up having a good stake in like, you know, a hundred cities, for instance. And that's how we think of, you know, we think of this as, you know, you know, sort of, you know, sort of proverbially like, let a thousand metaverses bloom. Actually, we think of each metaverse like, like an, a society and we should have a stake in, in all of them somehow as opposed to have one only, right? And that encourages that trade. So that's the investment strategy and the way that we build it. Now we are early, right? And so I think the advantage we have right now is that we can shape it. I think we're very blessed and fortunate that we're in a position where we can help shape a narrative that we weren't able to do before, right? And I think here's the other thing, you know, what does the end user prefer? What is better for them? And if they understand that, which is our customer, they will naturally guide us towards it. You know, as an institution, even though we are centralized, we are actually going to hurt ourselves if we say, you know, guys, actually, we take control of everything and you got to listen to everything we say, you know, that sense, we will lose our customers 
you know, as we grow the space. So naturally, the checks and balance comes into place because the assets, you know, belong to the belong to our users. They don't belong to us, right? And that's that's both the beauty and power of Web three. That's fantastic. What a great note to end on. I wish we could ask you questions all day. And I know that there's so many questions. Um, I appreciate those coming through. I guess um, just to leave on um, a, a really hopeful, but maybe slightly more concrete note, we have almost 600 people um, in this community right now listening to what you have to say. If there's one thing that they could do today to contribute um, in their own way and play different roles uh, in the glimpse of the metaverse, what do you think they should be uh, considering as? Well, first of all, I think, you know, Web3 NFTs in the metaverse is that next parallel, right? Meaning, and it is a little bit like sort of, you know, the I view it as the age of exploration, you know, where people go in and go into a new space, except we're not going to space, we're not going to Mars, we're going to the virtual world. And that virtual world, you know, is still needing to be populated by the billions of people who are online, but not yet really in the metaverse that they think they need to be in or they understand. And so for everyone here who's early, you are super early, you can benefit from helping build and participate. And one of the other things is that, you know, when you participate in a project or many projects, you're not only contributing to the ecosystem and build it. And by the way, please contribute in open projects, meaning, you know, buy assets from you know, like whether it's on Ethereum or Polygon or, or, or Flow, whatever, on blockchain, on-chain stuff that is in an open system that is openly composable, because, you know, that's where you're building and creating that ecosystem of, of, of value. You're only ultimately buying a piece of that network effect, right? And some may be good and some may not be, but it's not lost in terms of its value because you're building a community, right? And so, so, so even if you contribute a small amount, you know, you end up helping grow that ecosystem as a, whole, as a whole, but I encourage everyone to build in it as well, right? Because this is, you know, it needs builders, it needs you to participate and, uh, and the opportunity is there, just like in the age of exploration, it's for everyone. There's so much possibilities. Yeah, Sue, thank you so much. That's fantastic. I'm all riled up. Uh, Rochelle, um, I'll hand over to you, but maybe you could quickly let us know as well. Lots of people are asking, will this be recorded or will the recording be made available? Um, I think we all want to rewatch. No worries. Um, yes, yeah, so it still is being recorded throughout the whole day, guys. It will be available after the event. Um, I know I've seen a lot of questions in the chat about that, but after the event today, it will all be available. I just wanted to say thank you, Yat, and thank you, Kaya, for your session. It was lots of love for you, Yat, on, on Twitter, for sure. I've been seeing everyone talking about it. Um, thank you. So thank you, guys.